Good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast and good morning to those of you further west. Um, welcome to our webinar today. This is a part of the Appalachian Food Chat Project's monthly webinar series and we um, are looking at different, uh, explore different issues of community food security and, and ways to work in our food system and change our food system. And um, we're really excited to have you all with us today and we are super excited to have Tracy Conkler um, from Social Profit Strategies, uh, who's been working with us here at the AFP and, and linking our network um, through Circle Forward or Dynamic Governance. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about, about what, we're, what we've been doing and some opportunities for um, some visions for what might come. Uh, while, you're, um, while she's talking, I will be monitoring the chat. If you have questions for Tracy, um, either as we go along or questions you want her to answer at the end, please type those into the chat box and I am happy to make sure she uh, has a chance to answer those. And with that, I will turn it over to Tracy. Hi, Nikki, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here as well, too. And this is um, a kind of a new uh, framework that I have been um, teaching, and this is this is um, a new presentation, so I'm really curious about um, your questions and your comments and reactions as we go along. I love that feedback, and I think we're small enough um, that we can really have that kind of interactivity. So, like Nikki said, we'll be stopping and taking questions at different points, and um, and I just really love to get your feedback. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about myself. For about the past six or seven years, I've been in small consulting practices. Uh, Social Profit Strategies is now my own company. Um, I focus on strategic planning, governance, and facilitation primarily. Um, and I've had a consistent practice with organizations and networks involved in food system change work in my home region. So I live in Asheville, North Carolina, which is in the mountains of North Carolina. And I've been working really in, in South Central Appalachia, North and South Carolina um, over the last six to seven years. So I'm really proud to be able to say that I, you know, I'm working in my own bioregion. And that's really important to me to build these strong um, networks for change. I've worked with groups like the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. I'm actually working with them right now on a strategic plan, um, the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy, the Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project, of course, the Appalachian Food Shed Project, Asheville Buncombe Food Policy Council, the Sustainable Ag Education Association, Virginia Food Systems Council. Uh, we have an emerging Asheville Area Urban Agricultural Alliance. So these are just to give you a flavor for um, some of the groups that I've been involved in. So I've been able to really get in depth um, on food issues and I'm choosing to focus my work a lot now on network building because I'm finding that even as a small business owner and consultant myself that I'm orienting toward working in networks of partnerships with other businesses, with nonprofits, with government entities. And rather than seeing those as competitors in a world where resources are scarce, I'm, I believe that we're coming into a time where we have some really big issues to resolve, big social, economic, environmental issues, and that it's a time where we need all hands on deck. Um, so I think that our culture is really turning now to emphasize collaboration, and I see that in my own practice, and I see that with the clients that I work with. So I'm assuming today that I am talking to folks that don't need actually to be convinced that building diverse cross-sector networks is the way we need to go to solve these massive issues, like I said, social, economic, environmental, um, these massive issues and these massive system changes that need to occur. Um, I assume that you all see yourself in this quote. Um, I got this quote from this publication. It's a publication of a group called Scaling What Works, which is a learning initiative of grant makers for effective organizations. And grant makers or GEO, grant makers for effective organizations, 
is a community of more than 410 grant makers. And so you probably, the folks that I'm talking today, to today probably already know, and this publication is reinforcing that our mindsets need to be different when we're working through networks for change versus working as individual organizations, and that we're still learning about how to effectively work in networks. So I'm, again, I'm assuming you all are bought into networks, but we are all in this process of understanding what that means and, and how we need to change the way we work and trying to understand how we can effectively integrate the diversity that's needed at the table for effective decision making and effective work, collective work. And, and we also, this publication reinforces that grant makers and other funders also need to change the way that they fund the work and the way that they're working with their grantees. And that includes changing their assumptions about how to measure progress. I'm also going to set up and say that this um, presentation is focused on intentional networks. So networks is a catch-all term for a lot of different ways that we work beyond just our own small territories and work with each other. And intentional networks, um, as this definition here on the screen says, it's, you know, it's, they're intentional. So there's some form and boundaries around intentional networks. They have a common purpose. There's some sense of consistency in who the group members are, um, and there's some sort of organizational structure, or, or at least this network is moving toward that. So that's also, that's kind of the narrower audience um, for what I'm about to present are folks who are working in intentional networks. And the reason is, is that intentional networks are considering issues of governance. Um, and we use governance. Governance is a, another one of those very broad concepts. And we use governance in our families, our organizations, at our jobs. Um, governance is this uh, definition from the United Nations, and this graphic is from the United Nations. Um, the definition is just as the process of decision making in the systems by which decisions are implemented. So intentional networks are thinking about this very intentionally. Um, so they're not thinking about processes that are, I mean, this can be organic and this can arise and it certainly needs to be whatever governance system that folks are thinking about that they get intentional about needs to fit the particular context. Um, in community in which people are working. But we are thinking about this. The root of governance means to steer, and it's as in steering your organization or network toward its goal or its vision. And this graphic shows you some of the things that we think about when we try to design good governance systems. And I will just point out, sometimes people get <laughs> tweaked by the descriptor of follows the rule of law. So this did come out of the United Nations. This is meant to be comprehensive of lots of different governing systems, including nations. And um, we certainly want our national level governments to be following the rules of law. Um, but it also can be applied in more local contexts to think about following the agreements that we work, make with each other and sticking to our agreements. And sometimes those show, show up as bylaws or charters. So you can really reinterpret the language of following the rule of law. Um, some forms of governance help your life or your organization move forward with elegant coordination. Some forms of governance create obstacles and lead to breakdown. And I think we're in a transition of governance. We're needing to consider right now, especially with this new network framework and mindset, different forms of governance um, as our world grows more complex and diverse and the rules of the game are all around us changing, uh, we're trying to consider different ways, things that, um, trying out new behaviors in governance. So I'm going to focus on a particular system of governance, like Nikki said, that people have been trying out with some success. And it, it's a network of networks that have been connected in with the Appalachian Food Shed Project. And so as you look at this graphic here, you'll see that these circles 
represent, in most cases here, cross-sector networks involved in food system work. And these networks are all operating at, a diff at different levels of scale or scope. So as you read across the top of the graphic, you see that there are networks, the Appalachian Food Shed Project itself operates at a multi-state level and then connects in with state level initiatives, uh, more sub-state regional level initiatives down to the county level and even to the local level. So I'm going to get into what this means, which we're looking at here in a minute, but I just wanted to give you um, a picture of the broad scale where I'm going to go with the rest of this presentation. Now I'm going to start to break this down a little bit. So what's happening in this, the tool that I most want to emphasize and um, give to you all today to think about in terms of how we're linking together these circles of people, these intentional networks, um, that's a little bit different than the way we think about how we link up. And the tool is called double linking. And the basic concept is that the principle is that when we're connecting between circles at different levels of scope, we need two different leadership roles to connect them. This is a little bit different than the way we think of liaisoning. Um, and that way, we can coordinate. We can operate at different purposes, like with different purposes or at different levels of scope but we can still coordinate together as if we're one circle. And that's what this graphic is illustrating here. But let's kind of zoom in a little bit more on these two different leadership roles. Um, one leadership role, the outlink, is carrying the big picture perspective out to um, a subcircle or to the more specific area of scope. So for example, if this was a neighborhood and you had a, a council of neighborhoods, the council itself would send an outlink to individual neighborhoods to carry the big picture of the council, of the collective, of, the, of that bigger picture of all of the neighborhoods together and strategies and um, perspectives from that higher level of scope. And the other leadership role, the uplink, and we've gone around and around these names, and I think we're about ready to do a um, crowdsourcing to try to rename these. So we're trying to make them general enough. But the uplink would then be, in that neighborhood example, it would be the, the person from the particular neighborhood who comes up and participates on the council and brings the perspective, all those diverse perspectives of their particular um, neighborhood up to the council. And so what you get here then is a physical, structural, manifestation of two-way communication. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is both of these, and, and these are really leadership roles, um, because these folks have a particular uh, role to play in connecting and providing that two-way communication. But in this circle forward governance method, and we're only zeroing in on one piece of a whole governance system, but in this, each of these leadership roles would have consent in the decision making of each of those circles. So you can see, even though we have a hierarchy of sorts, you know, we have a neighborhood council that in some senses is, is, has a bigger scope of all of the neighborhoods, um, and each neighborhood has a smaller scope that's, that's focused on its particular neighborhood. By having these two different leadership roles, um, there, and, and each of those leadership roles having consent in each of their respective circles, both of them participating in both circles, it's impossible for this neighborhood council to um, dominate or to move forward um, in a way that is not considering um, the needs of each level. So the, the neighborhood has a voice in decision making that's thinking about the big picture, and the council has a voice in decision making that's thinking about the particular context of the neighborhood. I think I'm going to stop here and see if there are questions. Yeah. Are you jumping in? Yeah, Tracy, there was a, somebody just typed into the chat. Um, they're suggesting that in-link might be a more appropriate way to describe the flatness of the hierarchy. 
I really, I really appreciate somebody jumping in and on the naming question <laughs> because it's really hard. We went with uplink instead of inlink because of um, language and that it would potentially get confusing um, if you if you're the inlink to a group. It would feel like if you're coming from another group and you're representing another group, you're the inlink, you know, from that group. And so it just, as we played around with these names, and I am happy to talk with anybody who wants to play with names with me, but um, we we thought, yes, it would be more rational to have outlinks and inlinks, but it was a little bit more um, confusing um, to know, understand where you, what direction you were talking about, um, where you were coming from. Um, so... We're really super sensitive to the dominating aspects of hierarchy in our culture. And, um, and so this system does not allow domination. But hierarchies also are kind of, there's a kind of a natural form of how hierarchies, they, they kind of occur naturally, and they're also useful um, in many contexts. So if you have a very clear job that needs to get done, and it's scoped, and you have the consent of your circle, and you can empower somebody to get that job done, um, hierarchical forms can be really appropriate and useful and efficient in that context. So if we know we're pulling off an event and we need a, to cook for 200 people, and you put somebody in charge of the kitchen, and they decide where the carrot cutting station should be, you know, for that, you don't necessarily want that to all be by consent or have everybody involved in that decision-making. That's where groups can get really slowed down. So in the case where um, decision-making is really straightforward, or if the job is straightforward and, and understood, it's much more efficient to just put somebody in charge and, and, and then get out of their way. If we are trying to understand governance, we're trying to come to an understanding of where we're going together, we need everybody's voice in that kind of decision making. And this double linking process is a way that we can get everybody's voice even across circles so that we're moving forward together in a kind of a flocking pattern. So that's all I'll say about um, hierarchies and, and names. Um, I'm going to come back to this slide because I wanted to get into a little bit of like, okay, so how does this really work, this double linking? Um, I'll start with the Appalachian Food Shed Project, and I'll ask Nikki to jump in um, and share also your experience of how this has affected the management of the Appalachian Food Shed Project. So that orange circle that you see here is um, represents the collaboration between the three universities in Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina. Um, that serve the Appalachian regions of those states. So the um, North Carolina and Virginia circles at the state level are dotted because only part of the state is in Appalachia, but in West Virginia, the whole state is in Appalachia. And so that West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition is um, works fully, that whole region works, that whole state works with the Appalachian Food Shed Project. Um, but in the... In North Carolina and South, North Carolina and Appalachian, Virginia, um, the Appalachian Food Shed Project is connecting on a regional level, and there are um, two different networks that are forming in Western North Carolina and in Appalachian, Virginia. And I'm going to kind of focus and show you how this works. I live in Asheville, and and in the West, the Western North Carolina branch of the Appalachian Food Shed Project because of the experimenting and the work that um, I've been doing and others have been doing in this region, we've kind of developed, we're developing something here. Now, this is a picture, some of this is happening and some of this has the potential to happen. So part of the reason for me to do this webinar is really to encourage people that we can play with this tool and we can experiment and, and see if it actually gives us a way to have more powerful movements and, and to be able to coordinate our work together. But but stay also to have some autonomy at that level of scope that we're working. So if we're working on a county level, there's lots of decisions, lots of initiatives that we need to autonomously move forward with in our county. 
But when our county is impacted by state level policies that need to change, we need a way to um, understand how we're linking up with other food councils throughout the state. And we need our voice to be heard, our own county level um, needs and issues to be heard and understood and, and pulled together into a statewide initiative, for example. Um, and so this tool of double linking offers us some ways to very intentionally and, and hopefully quickly come together um, at larger levels of scale. So I'm going to go through very specifically the Appalachian Food Shed Project, in, and we're going to go through Western North Carolina first. You see there's a, an orange outlink there. The orange arrow is an outlink. That was our project staff. So that arrow actually is two people, Michelle um, Moreno Schroeder, who um, is a professor at NC State, and she's had Angel Cruz, a graduate student, working with her. And they came out to our region, held some regional meetings. They're, they've Since they've formed this Western North Carolina Community Food Security Council, they've invited regional level uh, folks to the table, cross-sector. So we have a funder, the Western North Carolina Community Foundation sits on that council, the health department, the cooperative extension rep, um, other nonprofit organizations, people who represent uh, food banks and food insecurity issues. And so this group's been meeting. They selected two representatives, actually, to um, then go up and be the uplink from the Western North Carolina group to the Appalachian Food Shed Project's management team. And so those two links from Western North Carolina have been full participating members of the AFP management team. So they've been helping to make decisions about direction for the AFP, um, funding, how grant funds would be distributed in the states. So lots of you know, big picture decisions. Likewise, Virginia and West Virginia are also sending uplinks up to the Appalachian Food Shed Project. What's happened, I think, is, is that the quality of decision making within that management team has gone up tremendously because it's not just the it's not just the paid staff from the university, it's not just university members anymore who are making those decisions, but they have the diversity of different community people and representatives in that decision making as well. And it's been tested a few times where community members have said, do we have full decision making in this circle? And, and, at, and we've negotiated through and they do. They have full decision making in the circle. Likewise, um, our, our outlinks coming from the project, the staff coming to the Western North Carolina Food Security Council also have full decision making um, in the regional decision making. So they bring a lot of information about, you know, how the money can be spent, you know, kind of the parameters of, of what this project is intending to do and, um, and, what, and what the project funds can be used for and things like that that's really important in the decision making at that regional level. In just the last half a year or so, this regional group has been double linking out to the county level. So we have some food councils that are have been online or who are coming online um, in several different uh, counties. And so I'm going to focus on the, the Asheville Buncombe Food Policy Council has been using circle forward processes for about two years now. Tow River Food Security Collaborative is, is still in formation. Um, but the Tow River Food Security Collaborative, there are actually, there's a, there's a project staff person from the Appalachian Food Shed Project who goes to those Tow River meetings. And the, um, the project director, project coordinator for that Tow River Collaborative comes to the Western North Carolina meetings. I'm going to give you an example of how this double linking worked really well um, recently. So that, that project manager came on board, and some decisions have been made about funding. And they were being funded, Tow River was being funded by a grant. And this, this project manager said, this timeline is crazy. We can't deliver what you're asking us to deliver in this time frame. Um, and, and she came up to the Western North Carolina meeting, 
course, she has full consent in the decision-making. They negotiated uh, the timeline and the project to where everybody could live with it and, and feel okay and good about it. Um, and that's kind of how this double linking process works is that at every level, people will have a clear kind of chain, communication chain, that if decisions are being made at, at a higher level, higher just meaning broader scope level, that there's a, you have a voice that um, can change that policy or adapt that policy to your local needs. The final thing I'll say about this structure here is that I've also been working with our public housing community, and they're really excited about this process because, of course, people who've been marginalized, who haven't had a voice in decision-making, they're really excited about how Circle Forward really enables a group, um, everybody to have a voice. And so here's one of those potential linkages that both network circles are interested in exploring. And I'll move on to the next slide. Um, the resident council, I can use this little arrow. Um, the, maybe I can. Uh, let's see. Having a, oh, there we go. So, so the re, so the residents council in public housing, and, and remember these folks are experiencing currently food insecurity. They are using this system, and you can see these double arrows, these double-headed arrows are representing the double links that they will be setting up in all of the public housing neighborhoods in Asheville, so that they can link into a council, and that link, that council can link into our food policy council. This isn't set up yet. This still needs to be adapted to the local situation. They need to figure out this will, this linking process will show up very differently. In, uh, in different organizations, but um, there's a conversation that's happening now so that people who are experiencing food insecurity actively now can have a voice on our Food Policy Council and not just a token voice, not just a person who's speaking on behalf of everybody who's experiencing food insecurity, but rather somebody that is a link that has accountability back to a whole network of people who've experienced food insecurity. So that uplink from that resident council to the Food Policy Council is representing the whole diversity of opinions and perspectives um, of people who experience food insecurity. So I see this as a way, this double linking, as a way to connect into kind of places where people naturally congregate and form intentional networks and to give them a voice in our food system councils and our food system networks. This could just as easily be a circle of farmers who decide to send a representative. The difference is that representative, again, has accountability to go back to their home circle and, um, and they have a role to play a leadership role with that home circle um, in terms of gathering those perspectives, staying in touch with people, checking out different ideas, um, and bringing those decisions back. So there's an accountability piece that, that um, isn't there if you just randomly select a farmer to be on your committee. You might have one farmer's voice on your committee, but with double linking, you could have many farmer's voices coming through that uplink representative. Um, I see a lot of questions, so I'm going to pause. And say, Nikki, do you want to help walk me through some of these questions? Sure. Um, there were a couple of questions um, on the last slide. Uh, one of the questions from Michelle Miller had to do with um, how long did it take to set these uh, networks up or these links up? Um, they're just starting to do it in the Midwest, uh, in the Driftless region. So. Mm. Um, and then there was a question about the, you may need to reiterate the solid circles versus the, um, versus the dotted circles. Uh, I'm not sure okay. I did a good well, let me, let, Yeah, let me start with, um, one is that we've been doing this, I guess, Nikki, for about two years. And, and it's mostly because this is so different and it, there's a lot of behind the scenes, like people need to try this and, and experience it. And, and I'm part of, 
what I hope is that we can get people on board to do this as an experiment. And if, if, we, if we find that this helps us to coordinate at this scale much better, that this becomes um, an example for other regions, that, that I think the learning curve will become shorter and shorter as this is used more and more often. And, um, and I'd be curious to follow up with Michelle Miller um, to find out what you all are starting to do in terms of trying to link up these networks. I'd love to have some conversations because I think we need to experiment. You know, none of this is, is perfect. Life still gets messy. You know, people are people and they bring their personalities and their leadership styles to the table. Um, but I'll also say we're working with um, folks who are evaluating this as we go, too. They're helping us to um, collect stories and so to, to really talk about what it is that, um, what's going on here. But we've, we've just found that um, people feel like they have a voice. People feel like they have influence um, when they use this double linking process. It's really um, strengthened relationships. It's strengthened our understanding of what we're each doing in these three different states. You know, it's, it's created communication channels. People are interested in continuing um, Something, even as the AFP, that big orange circle, won't stay the same when that project completes in February of 2016. And so, you know, I'd love to, um, again, talk to folks who are involved in this work and think about, well, you know, this, this constellation here that I'm showing you today will change as different um, parts of this different circles, different networks change, this, this whole constellation will change. But I would say the double linking has, has enabled people to start to have the imagination for having uh, these multi-state networks, something of a multi-state network continue and persist. The dotted lines, just to say again, the dotted lines in the yellow area at the state level just reflect the fact that North Carolina and Virginia are only partly in Appalachia and the rest of the state is not in Appalachia. So that's what that double, lot, double uh, dotted line means there. And, um, and I just put a dotted line around the blue Western North Carolina Food Policy Council because that um, is not in this network yet, although it potentially could be. It's kind of not in the scope of this project either yet, um, although it could be. So, is Tracy, there another there, question? Maybe? There are, um, there, there's another question from Bakari. Um, are there formal mm -hmm. agreements in place amongst organizations, uh, for example, an MOU, partnership agreements, et cetera? Yeah, and so that varies quite a bit um, along this. Just, you know, these circles all look they're all the same size and they're the same shape and they're just different colors, but, you know, it's, it's, they are in different places with their um, levels of connection. I don't think, I'm trying to think of any of them. Nikki, do you know, I, maybe the Student Farm Coalition in West Virginia is at the level of formal MOUs. Um, the Appalachian Food Shed Project has, I mean, you just have a management practice. We have a policy that will, you know, I'm saying we, but the AFP has a policy of including community voices on the management team, but it's not an official MOU. Yeah, we're not, we're not working on that. And, and, and I don't know, Tracy, if you're going to get to this, so you can cut me off. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as the Appalachian Future Project Circle, um, our relationships and our, the, the structure that supports this double linking is different with each state. So, mm -hmm. for instance, Tracy's been working in Western North Carolina, and that straight line across the middle of your slide is the most formal and established linking network that we have. Um, you know, we have two uplinks and downlinks that go directly to this WNC Community Food Security uh, Council, and it's a really formal process. They take things back, and they bring things back to the circle, and, and um, the, the relationship with the, with the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition and even with the Appalachian Virginia Food Systems Council is at a different, um, is a different sort of linking. So our West Virginia partners are involved with the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition, but they're not 
directly accountable to the Food and Farm Coalition and vice versa. So, um, so, our, so the way, and that's just the way these have, are evolving differently and us trying to work across three states where the yeah. states are operating differently and at different places um, kind of in that level, and of it's kind of like it's kind of like stages of development, Nikki. I would think it's just you know I would say, and the, and I personally don't have a relationship with West Virginia, but I'm working right now with the Appalachian Virginia Food System Council, and so what I would say and what I want to say, and I know we've got folks on the um, call here today from that group, is would you all like to create a more formal relationship and sense of accountability back and forth with the Appalachian Food Shed Project um, and then keep thinking about when that particular um, network is no more, like what do, what do we want to replace that? Do we want to find another way to connect across central Appalachia? Um, and we might want to include Tennessee and Kentucky and Southern Ohio and there's, you know, so there are different intentional networks right now that are working at different scales and we may be able to, to plug into um, like the Appalachian Funders Network right now is working at this scale and could we plug into them and, and so does Appalachian, does this uh, Virginia Food System Council want to take this double linking to the next level and really start to be intentional about it and practice with it and experiment and say does this help us to feel linked into something much bigger than us. And and even practicing it with, they're looking right now um, for how to link in with this, their statewide council. And you can see by their names, they're really interested in having a relationship between the Appalachian region of Virginia and the whole state, like having a relationship between those networks. And they're looking also at possibly having networks all the way down to the county level. And so I think it's a stage of development. I think they just haven't been inten as intentional as Western North Carolina about we're trying this out we and, you know, using double linking. And that's what I'm hoping begins to happen. They don't, I, and it's, it's just to say it's going to – it will show up, and I'm, I think you really make this point well, is it will look different every time it's applied. <laughs> it's going to – it's going to take shape according to – the locality and the people involved. Go ahead, Nikki. I, I think, but I think for me, um, and then I want to make sure you get Christy's uh, Gabbard's mm -hmm. question as well. Um, for me, though, I think one of the nice things about this sort of um, structure is that it allows for that um, difference of evolution, if you will. So we can still, we're still, it's still an improved and more effective way of governing our project by doing this linking, even when people are linking in that are not formally um, accountable mm -hmm. to another space, and and I think having different stages of of kind of development allows people to sort of see and experience the way other structures are working and other um, more formally developed circles are kind of are interacting. So I, I think it's been I've been impressed with the way the, um, the way that uh, this has allowed us to be. Um, versatile and 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 engage all those uh, different networks wherever they are in their network development. So I think that's a really positive thing. Um, and Tracy, I want mm -hmm. I'm going to I want to make sure we get mm -hmm. Chrissy. We have two more questions. Chrissy Gabbard sure. asks, do you see individuals having a role in the network, or is it just representatives of organizations? Ah, uh, this is see we are learning with each other. I often say representatives of other of organizations because that's who oftentimes is showing up at the table, but Absolutely, individuals are part of these circles. Actually, at every, I would say most of these circles here are individuals um, are participating right alongside organizations. These food system councils are very diverse, and it it is great that a lot of different entities participate and people participating just as people who care about food system. Um, and we we live in we live in worlds where we have multiple associations, so. You know, every time we sit down at the table, we may even, you know, we, we have multiple kinds of associations that we come to the table with, like always. And so, you know, that richness just creates the possibility for more, um, more, all, more, more encompassing solutions, more broad 
thoughtful, intelligent solutions. I do want to say one more thing before we leave this picture, and I'm going to get to Jessica's question. Um, if you follow these arrows around these circles, you'll see that this creates one large circle. This creates one big loop. And I, I just want to say that, that that's kind of a basic, one of the basic principles in this circle forward governance system is, is that is, is how to create these continuous loops and how to connect systems and how to transform governance with the intention of creating prosperity for all. So it's, 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 this is a way that from the very local level to a multi-state level, you can have, in essence, one large circle, which you could never have people sitting in one big circle together, but it gives you structurally the, some of the advantages that you would have in terms of, of people's participation and people's voice in influencing how this whole network moves together. It creates a kind of a flocking um, behavior. Like as, if you're watching starlings flocking, these are all autonomous, and yet we can move together. So let me ask Jessica, what's the best way to create formal relationships to have more accountability from the county level as representatives to the state level council? Um, Nikki, do you, I'm not sure that I quite understand as representatives. I'm not sure I quite understand. Maybe Jessica, I don't know if we can get Jessica on the line to explain that question. I'm not sure. Do you, do you think, do you want to take a stab at it, Nikki? Uh, I'm not sure I can take a stab at it, but I mean, I think, I think what, um, I think what Tracy is suggesting with this, this double linking is, is a fairly formal relationship. So, so what yeah. you're looking at with that, again, with this slide, with the Appalachian Food Job Project, if you look straight horizontally across, um, you could you can plug in food councils. So you know if you have a local food council and then you have a county food that feeds into a county food council that feeds into a regional food council that feeds into um, a state group that feeds into a multi-state group. Uh, I mean, in a very linear, <laughs> um, nice mm -hmm. organized chart related way, um, you can have that formal. Those links are 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 formal. So you can have you have one person that's coming up and then one person that's going back down at each level. So I think that's what, um, and Jessica, please, the, the process of creating formal relationships to get them more engaged as representatives. Oh, that, well that, Tracy, she might be asking about mm -hmm. con, your con, the consent process, which you haven't really talked much about. So I don't know if you want to take a minute to address mm -hmm. that. Well, okay, so first of all, this is just one particular constellation. So I think Nikki, what Nikki keeps um, helping to reinforce here is that this is just one particular constellation, and, and, and there's, lots of, there's lots of variety in the way this shows up. So if you have a county that you're working in and you're thinking about creating a level to the a connection, a more formal relationship to the state level, we could have easily connected the Asheville Buncombe Food Policy Council, you know, if if the, all these different actors who are involved in these different networks decide that the best thing to do is to have a connection between the North Carolina Food Policy Council and the Asheville Buncombe Food Policy Council, they could decide to create linkages. They could say, basically what you're saying is, we're each going to select somebody who's going to come to your meeting. And so North Carolina would select somebody to come to the meeting of Buncombe Food Policy Council. Buncombe would select somebody to go to the North Carolina meeting. So rather than have one person that's going back and forth, we create that two-way communication by actually having two people. Um, and there's a process we use to make sure that the person that's selected has the trust of the group and that... Um, is accountable back to their home group. And so I won't get into that process, but there's a particular process that we use for selecting leadership that's, that's different also from how we're used to selecting leadership. But um, it's very powerful for getting the right people in the right roles. Um, so this, you would want to think of these links 
as leadership roles and, and you would want to select them from your group to perform a certain set of functions on behalf of your group um, and making sure that they're really bringing the perspective. Um, one of the things that happened, I'm going to go to the Food Policy Council, one of the things that happened in the Food Policy Council when they started out in Buncom, they had, they, they liked the idea of double linking and so they started, they broke into these clusters. So they started more with the people, the council started as, you know, 70 people getting together in a, a big workshop and, and then dividing themselves out into the areas that they were most interested in. And they call those clusters. And so you see the clusters around their central council here, land use and farmer support and health and education, things like that. Those clusters then sent two representatives to a general council. That's what formed their general council were the two representatives that went from each cluster. What happened over time is that because they didn't have the outlink, they, they had two people basically with the same job of bringing up what's going on in the cluster and then participating in the general council. The council as a whole sort of, it, it sort of lost touch with what was going, and, I mean, amazingly kind of lost touch with what was going on in, the, in all these different clusters. It was like there wasn't that outlink, there wasn't that big picture view that was being carried out to each of these clusters. And I see this a lot in how networks form because we really are sensitive to domination like the hierarchical kinds of domination. And so a lot of times these clusters, they, that's where we want policy making to happen and we want to give them a lot of freedom to pursue whatever they want to pursue. But then we lose kind of the centralizing like aspects of being a food policy council and working on a collective strategy. And so we've been you know, talking with the Food Policy Council about how can the general council really think about one of those reps being the, the outlink so that the general council has somebody with the big picture that's participating in these clusters and, and making decisions with the clusters from the point of view of, of what are we doing as a whole council. Does that make sense? So, so they really actually needed this see that, oh, we really need that outlink role as much as we need that uplink role from each of these clusters. Now, if you think of the looping, if I'm on a cluster and I'm coming, I'm part of the decision making of the general counsel, I'm part of planning the big picture that the outlink is bringing back to my cluster. <laughs> so it's just this, this continuous loop. All right, let me see if there's some more questions. Do you consider the policy work of different members so they are learning from each other? Yeah, I mean, how we create processes in these circles that are inclusive is very important to me. And, and so, um, you know, having those different voices at the table, um, you see in this graphic here, the Food Policy Council once, you know, if, if they choose to create these more formal double links with the Western North Carolina Community Food Security Council, with the Resident Council, you see they're inviting these different levels of scope and perspective to their general circle. And it's going to transform their connectivity, both their connectivity into the regional level and beyond, and their connectivity down into the neighborhood level. Um, they're picture of things is going to expand as they invite these different points of view to the table and as they take their point of view out to these different tables. So absolutely learning from each other, absolutely not squelching these different voices, but finding processes that help us to find consent and move together in a coordinated way is is the principle that we're working from. So I hope that answers Anne's question. Um, some of the stuff that's happening at, at the state level doesn't concern the county level as much. Some of what's happening at the county level won't concern the state. But where they intersect, they have a way here to inform each other. 
Um, I will, I do think that this will be on, somebody's asking, can we share this, these slides, and these will be available on the AFP website. After this, and I guess I'm just going to finish. Nikki, do you have anything more to add? Do you think anything, any more thoughts come up? Um, I, you know, in terms of uh, Anne's question about coordinating the policy work of the different members, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not. We haven't really gotten into it, Tracy, about you know how decisions are made in each of these circles with consent, and I don't know. Maybe that's a subject mm -hmm. for another another webinar, but um, in, in my experience, though, it's, it's not a top-down uh, type of, you know, the Appalachian Future Project or one of these food policy councils says, okay, well, now we need to, you know, this is what you should be working on at the regional level and this is what you should be working on the county level and the local level. It's much more organic than that. Um, and there is, the nice thing about the, the double linking is that it's a, um, it, it's almost kind of hard to, I think it's kind of hard to describe and, unless you actually are, have experienced it, but it's, it's, it's an up and down sort of um, on, constantly like flowing conversation. So, um, so there is coordination that happens um, just by the very fact that, uh, this, and this may also get to Jessica's question about, I think about um, uh, participation. Uh, so it's not just a representative. You're not just having a token. I mean, everybody's been at those meetings where you have you want a farmer on the on the um, on the council, or you want a person that is from a low wealth community on the council, and they're your representatives from those communities. And then they get there and they just sit there and and they maybe say I when there's it comes time for a vote. But this the 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 governance process that actually happens in these circles um, is much more is by definition very engaging. Everybody has to participate and it um, decisions are, are made uh, with everyone's consent. So it's not a voting, it's it's not consensus. Um, every voice has decision making power to stop the process or or um, or change the process. And Tracy, I, we don't have enough time probably to get into that, but that might be something. Um, I'll give one example, um, Nikki. In, in the Appalachian Food Shed Project has enhancement grants. You know, funding is a slippery slope. We can get really into a lot of trouble just trying to, and we do, we have to figure out in these networks, how are we sharing resources and how are we distributing resources fairly? And we were deciding about how the, enhance, the first um, round of enhancement grants were going to work. And I remember, and I, I, I think that this is fine to share openly, but we were in the meeting and people were concerned about the community representative being part of the decision making around the application process. Like how, how are, what are we looking for in applicants and what is our application process going to be? And, and there were folks that were concerned from the academic team, academic folks that, about the community partners who might want to apply for these grants was that giving them an unfair advantage? Was there a conflict of interest in having them in on the decision making about the, the application process? And one of the community partners said, wait a minute, you are saying we're full participating members of this management team, and just when it comes to you know, this sticky issue, like, wait, no, it's, we're used to you all pulling back when it's a really sticky issue, but, but I think that we really need to be part of this and we just need to be transparent about the fact that we were part of deciding about this application process. Now, the conflict of interest, we certainly can't be on the committee that chooses the grant recipient. Obviously, that would be a conflict of interest. But what we all came to was that those community partners really had important insight to offer into the decision making about how that application process came about. And um, and we did that and we followed through and those fears of, you know, that the community is going to see this as a conflict of interest just never materialized because we were just transparent about this. So that was the way that that consent process, the, the food chip project, the management has been really holding this principle of we're not going to we're going to work with you and negotiate with you until we find a solution that we can all live with. 
and that we can all go forward with without reservation. And so we've, we've had to talk out some really sticky things. Did, that, did I describe that properly, Nikki? I think it was a good, a good shot for the amount of time you have. And <laughs> I think it, it's a good starting point and, um, and a great place for maybe some uh, additional um, conversations. Uh, I want to make sure, Bakari has, I think, a good mm -hmm. question about formal agree agreements, um, follow up to that. Um, they're asking because uh, how do you measure impact? If not formal partners, what defines membership in the network? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, that's a that's a that's a definitely a big question. Um, I would say there's a couple of things. I have heard it described recently that if you are getting like formal agree when you have trust in a system, then the formal agreements, the, the written agreements, the kind of legalistic agreements, um, are less important. I don't. I think they're important for clarity a lot of times, but being networked in this kind of a governance system is really about fostering trust, and it's really creating the conditions for deep trust, trusting each other, learning to trust each other. So I, I want to say that there isn't a there's an emphasis on that trust building and that relationship building primarily, and um, we. Mm -hmm have different ways right now of talking about impact, but in general with these networks, one of the most important measures of impact is about the relationship building that's happening. In fact, when you form these networks, the guidance that we're getting in the Collective Impact Forum is a great website and resource for how to measure impact in networks. So I'll just give a shout out to the Collective Impact Forum on, on how you measure um, how you can measure impact in networks since we're running out of time. And um, I think I'm just going to close with some pictures. So this is one of my favorite systems type pictures, the fractal structure. I think that's what we're, this uh, Circle Forward Governance gives us some tools to create these fractal structures. It's a mathematical term. Um, and basically it's a very simple mathematical formula that produces, that they run this simple formula over and over and over again, and it produces these kinds of um, images and systems where every little part of this system is kind of duplicated in the whole. So at the very high level, it looks very similar and has some of the same elements as the, as the smaller and smaller levels, but there's also just like, individual variation as well. It's a very interesting, you can look up fractals. But this picture to me kind of gives me like an artistic representation of what I see our world moving into as our networks connect and as we, those networks break down into smaller and smaller, more local and local, uh, local circles. And I think the final uh, slides, this is another view of this double linking structure. So what you can see is our healthier networks are those that are more connected from the, the highest scope, broadest scope, down to the most local scope. And, and so this gives us a way to kind of create that diversity and connection. And this is a mouse brain. And again, I feel like this is the direction we're going, is, is we're forming these clusters, these clusters of individuals and organizations coming together in networks. Like I say, as a small business, I'm networking with other professionals as well. Um, in delivering services because we want to have impact at a much larger scale. We need to be creating the kind of co-intelligence across our communities, um, like this brain picture here, this mouse brain implies. We need to have that kind of co that co-creation, that co-intelligence across our communities to really address these system level issues. So this circle forward system has some biomimicry in that we're, we create clusters and then we create connections between those clusters. And that's kind of the most basic principle. And I'll just say it again, Circle Forward is about creating these continuous loops and connecting our systems and transforming our governance so as to create prosperity for all. Thank you very much.
for your time today. Anything you want to close with, Nikki? No, I just want to thank everyone for some really great questions. Um, I'll put some, mm -hmm. We'll put this up on the website, um, and you have Tracy's email there. Um, again, and my email is, is there as well. If you have any follow-up questions or, or would like to be notified when this webinar is available. Um, and again, if you have any other um, questions or suggestions for a follow-up webinar with, uh, that we might do to kind of parcel out uh, some of the stuff that, that Tracy has, has brought to us, please let us know. We'd love to continue the conversation. So thanks again, Tracy. I, I think you've given us a lot to think about. Yeah, and please email me if you have follow-up. Um, I'm very happy to, to talk more. And I see some of you have left me your email, so I'm happy to keep this conversation going. Thanks. And have a great holiday, everyone. Take care.